I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for being with us this morning. I know I had a lot of people ask me already about the, the stage set this morning. Some people have asked if we're going to do a game show. The answer is no. It's not the isolation booth. Uh, others have said, am I going to do a magic trick? No, that's not going to happen either. Uh, some of you may wish that I would disappear by the end of this, but we're going to hope that that doesn't happen. Now, what I want, and I know it's risky to put something like this up here because it's, a, it's an illustration that could have a tendency of overshadowing the point, but, but I think I can bring the point to what this is. And we're going to talk about it, and we alluded to it a little bit last week. We're going to talk about it a little more this week. But I want you to, as we, as we get into it, I want you to think in terms of how you process life. What happens up here in your mind when life, as life is happening, as you need to make a decision, as, as a problem comes before you that you need to deal with, or maybe there's a temptation to do something. Maybe there's a situation that someone throws into your lap and you're trying to figure out what's the best way to cope. When heavy emotion comes our way, those things are all things that we process. And it happens before you know it. And I think because of the passage that we're focusing on, this morning, I know that what Satan would have us do, would like for us to do more than anything, is to ignore that this exists in each of our lives. To just not pay any attention to it. Because what happens in there has the potential to be life-changing. And as, as we look at the admonition of Scripture to change how we think, what this represents plays a really, really, really crucial role. An important part of how we grow spiritually and how we become more and more and more like Christ. Think of a moment in your life when you had to kind of make a split decision. I think I've told the story before of, of, uh, of a time at, when Lenore and I were at Harding. We had just started, we hadn't been dating long and, and there was a snow that came on campus. Uh, not, that didn't happen very often, maybe a couple of times and the whole time I was at Harding was there a snow that covered the ground enough to where you could make a snowball. Uh, but I remember that morning, it was really exciting that that snow had, had we'd been blessed with the snow. And I had made a, a very, what I thought was a perfect snowball. And I had thought of a few friends that I was hoping to see in case that snowball uh, could come into use. <clears throat> I was planning on really getting somebody good with it. But as we walked, and we were walking to, the, to what was at that time the dining hall. Um, if you went to Harding, how many of you ate in the old patty cob? Do any of you remember that? Hey, all right, there's some of you that did. Um, Lenore and I ate there, and, and we were walking in that direction when, for some unexplained reason, she still hasn't been able to explain it adequately for me, she decided to take a bunch of snow and scoop it off of the bushes, and it went on my face and down my shirt and that kind of a thing. And she thought it was funny. And then she ran. And I was holding this snowball. And, and I know she knew I was a hunter, but she doesn't know how tempting a moving target is. <laughs> and, and so this, late, this, this girl that I was suspecting would be my bride someday is running down the sidewalk, and I had to make a decision. Now, all of you know, and all, all of you, I'm guessing, have experienced the, fact, the, the illustration that we've seen out there of the angel and the devil that's on, that's on his shoulders. And as you're thinking of these things, they're both providing input, Right? Uh, the angel saying, now, she may remember this for the rest of her life if you do this. And all the devil saying is, get her. I succumbed to temptation. And, and I didn't mean for it, but I threw the snowball, and I threw a little high of where I was aiming. And it hit her right in the back of the head. And uh, my brother, who was standing closely, uh, didn't help me out by, that much by saying, Good shot. Man, I didn't think you'd be able to do that. And she has actually remembered that for the rest of her life to this point. So and it was that, again, in that moment where you're having to make a, a split decision. You're having to decide what's best in this situation. Thankfully, I believe she's have a, she has a forgiving heart and was able to forgive me for that. But in some situations, that's maybe not the case. 
Maybe you've wounded someone in a real way, in a way that's going to last. How do we go about making those, those decisions? How do we go about facing those times in our lives when we need to do the right thing, and yet it's not super clear at the moment what that right thing is? It engages a conversation in our heads. And I know that, you know, again, we're not talking about the, the kind of conversations that they talk about in abnormal psychology class. We're talking about these, the normal kind of conversations that happen with us when we're considering or thinking about a course of action, something that we need to do. How do we do the right thing when the right thing is what's called for? That requires thought. Even some of the famous psychologists like Sigmund Freud suggest that there's an ongoing conversation happening inside of our heads. He named the, the voices the id, ego, and superego. If you've had psychology, you remember what those stand for. The id's kind of the, the pleasure side of us, the part of us that wants to, to gratify the cravings of our flesh, to use scriptural terms. The id saying, if you feel it, do it. If it feels good, do it. The superego is on the other side, and it's, it applies itself to the morality of things. Should I do this is what the, is what the superego asks. Is this, is this something that I should do? And the ego is in the middle of the two, saying, what's going to be right? Do I, do I gratify and get what I want, or do I hold off and, and uh, apply another uh, course of thinking here? However, whatever we call it and whatever we look at it, and however we look at it, there is a conversation that goes on and takes place. There's a conversation that happens within us that helps us to make a decision in terms of what we're going to do and how we're going to move forward. Life pushes us to move forward. It pushes us to do, to do something. And in those times, we need to do the right thing, the thing that God would want us to do. But again, in those times, it's not always clear because there's a lot of things going on up there and sometimes it's difficult. And our passage that we're focused on this morning is in Romans chapter 12. If you'd go ahead and turn there. In Romans chapter 12, Paul's giving instructions on how to apply some of the things that he's talked about earlier in the chapter. We introduced the chapter uh, last week, so I'm not going to go deeply into that. But remember that he's talked about the amazing things that God has done for us. And that in response to those amazing things, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, a righteousness that's by faith, Romans chapter 1 talks about. And those things that he's given us should cause us to respond in certain ways. And he says the way we respond is by offering our bodies as living sacrifices. Read verses 1 and 2 with me of Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. I'm going to read it in the, in the New Living Translation as well. I love what this has to say. We're going to read it one more time. He says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So when he talks about transformation, and that's one of the things we want to focus on here, is transforming from one thing to another. And when you're transformed, it's, if you think of a butterfly, it's transformed from one thing to another. And, and usually when we think in terms of a transformation, we think of a positive change, a change in the right direction, in a good direction. And so when we're transformed, in this passage he says, we're transformed from the ways or the pattern of the world, a worldly way of thinking and a worldly way of acting, to a, to, and we're transformed to a way that's obedient to God's will to doing what he wants us to do. He says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We want to know what his will is. 
We want to be able to hear him as he speaks to us and shows us in many ways what his will is. And that way, we offer our lives as sacrifices. And we're able to act out, act out the way he wants us to act. When we're transformed, when we are being transformed, we're doing things differently. There is no way, you wouldn't use the term if there was a way to transform and be the same. It's just not possible. When we're transformed, it looks different. Therefore, when as Christians, if we're seeking to be transformed, as this passage clearly tells us to be, then we need to look different and in a continual kind of way. It's not an overnight change. It's not something that happens in a short period of time. It's something that happens in a continual way over the, over the course of our lives. We become more and more of what God wants us to do. We're able more and more to know where he wants us to go. And that involves changing. And in this passage, and I think it's absolutely wonderful, it's absolutely eye-opening and life-changing when he shows us that that change begins not in how we act, but in how we think. What happens between our ears? Because, as we said last week, thinking precedes action. Before we do things, before we take action, we always think about it. Now, sometimes, and we're going to talk about this a lot, sometimes the thinking doesn't look like it's supposed to look. Sometimes it's more reacting, and we've got to watch that. But when we think, we want to make our thoughts, Paul will later say, I, I take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. We want our thoughts to be obedient to Christ. That's easy, isn't it? Have you tried it? It's not that easy, right? It's not that easy. Because again, there's a lot of different things coming into this thought box. I want you to think of a thought box as a place where things flow. When you have to think about something, you go into your thought box. Kind of like I am now. This is where you sit and ponder things. This is where all of the input comes in. All right, the things that you're thinking about are affected by things like experiences that you had when you were younger, things people have told you, things you've seen in television and different kinds of media, things in books that you've read, wounds from the past. Sometimes if you were neglected or abused when you were younger, the voice of that abuser comes in and you're hearing it when you're here in the thought box. You're hearing advice, both good and sometimes not so good. And we're going to talk again about how we sort those kinds of things out. We're going to look at the role of emotion in your thought box and how that affects what you think and how it affects the direction that you go. But this morning, we're going to focus on the two main inputs to your thought box. And those inputs, just mark it. I'm going to bump my head at, at some point in time. Those inputs are both spiritual. There are two inputs that we can do very, very little about. They're open channels that God built us with. The first one, of course, is a channel that is dedicated to Him. He has input through His Holy Spirit into your thought processes. And that as you think, God has, has access to you. It can be through the Scripture, as you read Scripture. It can be through the voice of someone else, a godly person who's talked to you in your life. But there's no doubt that there is a spiritual input from God as you're considering the actions. There's also something from the other direction. We don't know exactly how He does it or exactly what it looks like in everybody's life. But there's also spiritual input from the other side. We hear input from, and again, depending on your theology, whether it's Satan himself. Some, some people ask the question, is Satan omnipresent? Can he be there with all of us? Or is he located in one's, I don't know. That's not what we're going into in this lesson anyway. 
Um, but whether it's him or whether it's the voice of some of his minions, there's no doubt that there's a, a real voice that we hear from that side of things. And those real voices are generally, from both sides, are generally conflicting. They give us a conflicted sense, and sometimes that confliction can be confusing. It, it provides the tension that we feel in those moments when we have to make a decision. The angel and demon analogy. It gives us that tension that we feel in that moment as to whether we do one thing or another. Again, there are a lot of different things that come in there. We have preferences, filters, emotion. But what comes out of the thought box, so we have those things coming in, and we're going to be putting some things on here that kind of illustrate that. Those things come in. They have the spiritual influences. We have uh, emotion, things that happened in the past, uh, things that people tell us, all of that coming into the thought box. And what comes out then are our actions, our behaviors, our decisions, our attitudes, all of those things flow out of the thought box. Literally what we do comes from what happens inside of here. And the interesting thing about that is, is that it makes your thought box ground zero for spiritual warfare. That's where it happens, right there. And that as you, are, as you have influence from both sides, as both sides are are vying for your attention, and you feel that tension. We've all felt it. You feel that tension. You know that that's spiritual warfare that's happening there. Paul here is saying, be transformed by changing how you think. There's something that's a little unequal here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak from personal experience, from the experience that I know of. From people I know of, you may have a different experience, but here's mine. And, and I'd be interested to know if it's yours as well. That the side of darkness, the spiritual side of darkness is always on, it's loud, and it wants you to think that his voice is your voice. It's always on, it's loud, and it wants you to think that its voice, that voice, is your voice. In fact, it may, you may hear that voice in your voice sometimes, but it's not. It's not your voice. It's pushing you towards selfishness. It's pushing you towards greed, towards anger, towards hatred, towards prejudice. All of those are being pushed by the dark side. And it doesn't come in the form of the guy in the red suit with the pitchfork, right? Right? It comes in the form of everything you want. Pleasures, wealth, gifts, status. All of those things are what Satan is pushing you towards as he talks to you about how to handle each situation in your life. And the spiritual battle is fought one decision, one situation, one trip to the thought box at a time. And when you're in there, again, these things are striving to influence you. On the other hand, while the one side is loud, always on, and wants you to think that its voice is your voice, the other side is pretty much the opposite. God's voice is quiet. It's to the point. And it's something you must seek to be able to hear regularly. One side, loud, always on, wants you to think your vo its voice is your voice. The other side, quiet, to the point, and you have to seek it. That almost seems unfair, doesn't it? That in order to hear from God, in order to hear his voice, we have to seek it. We have to strive to listen. We have to strive to block out the other things that seem to interfere with it and just focus on what God is trying to say to us. It almost sounds like renewing your mind when you do things like that. Focusing off of what the dark side is telling you and fo focusing on to what he's telling you. The essence of spiritual transformation, this is an important point, 
is recognizing the inputs of these two sources and seeking the voice of God that comes through the Holy Spirit while turning away from the input of the evil one. That's the essence of spiritual transformation. If we begin to recognize the voice of darkness for what it is, and we begin to seek the voice of God for what it is, we begin to experience transformation by renewing our mind. Here's the caution. It's not as easy as you think. Because when you start to, to identify those voices inside of you, you don't know how much you value what the darkness is telling you until you begin to recognize that voice. You don't, be, you don't realize how much you value that. You don't realize how important that voice is, even sometimes when that voice is trying to make you think negative things about yourself. But you tend to value that input because there's something inside of you, and it's some of you, it, this is the case. There's something inside of you that's convinced that you're not a good person. You're convinced that if people really knew you, they'd never really like you. If they knew what you've done or where you've been or the thoughts that you had, there's no way that they would, that they would like you. And so the dark side has said, put up a pretend front, be someone that you're not, and hide the other part in the background. Don't be real. Pretend. But when you go into your thought box, it's tormenting. Because in your thought box, you know, I'm not really who I am. What people see is not really who I am. But I've got to keep hiding. I've got to keep putting up that front because if people discover who I am, there's no way they'll like me. God says something very, very different. First of all, he says, I'll never define you by those things that you, that you think other people won't like you by. But if you come out with those things, if you actually tell it to someone, it doesn't have to be everyone, your closest people, and you let them get to know you for who you really are, then I'll show you how they'll like you. I'll show you how I can transform your image because of what I've done for you so that you'll be someone that's not only likable but extremely lovable. God has a different look at things, and we're going to be looking at those as we go through the rest of Romans chapter 12. How we, how we use the thought box to renew our minds and to be transformed into the image of God's Son. Let's go to that last slide. Having a kingdom mind is about taking every thought captive and making it obedient to Christ. That's a reference to 2 Corinthians 10.5. Making our thoughts obedient to Christ. Turning down the noise in our thought box the noise, a lot of it coming from the other side, and turning up the volume by seeking God's voice, reading his scripture, spending time with him in prayer, listening for what he has to say, understanding and discerning the voice of the Holy Spirit and what he's saying to you, understanding that the essence of transformation is recognizing the two voices, turning away from the darkness and turning towards God and what he's trying to say. That is, that's the essence of what we're trying to do here. We're going to be talking more about the different inputs that come into the box later on. We're, but, but we need to know that renewing our minds has to do with focus. What we focus on and what we value in terms of these inputs is going to play a key role. We're going to talk about emotion and the role that it plays in there. It's a wild card. And we're going we're gonna to talk about the role of emotion and what that does in our thought box. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's an interesting thing to talk about. When we think in terms of the input from the darkness, a lot of times it goes by the worldly standard. When Paul says, turn away from the worldly standard, be not conformed to the pattern of this world. When he says, turn away from the worldly standard, the worldly standard generally is thinking, is this something that's good for me? Will it make me happy? Will it cause people to pay attention to me? Will it cause things to, good things to happen for me? Generally speaking, when that kind of thing happens, you're, you're listening to the voice of the darkness. And it's pushing you more and more and more towards the side of the world. But what God tasks us with here through his apostle Paul 
in terms of renewing our minds is listening to and attending to the voice of God. What's he telling us? How's he guiding us? And how's he leading us to do the right thing? Listen, the voice of the world is loud. Always has been, I suppose it always will be. It's always going to be asking us to depend on what we know and what, what people have told us, what thing, what the, looking at what's happened in our past. And sometimes the voice of God is counterintuitive like that. And yet our motto for the thought box is what's on the screens. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. I'm reading from the NIV. That's the NLT up there. He will show you what path to take as you listen to him. You know, one of the lies that Satan wants to tell us is that when we're seated in our thought box, that we're in control. That we determine the output that comes out of this. That each of these inputs have equal value and we just need to choose the one we like the best. That's what Satan's gonna say. Which one do you like the best? Which one's gonna get you what you want? God's voice is gonna say something very, very different. What's it like to turn our attention to God? To allow him to be the primary influence. To let go of those things that we see as things that we want or things that are good for us. To let go and let God. To listen to what he's saying. To allowing him to help us to process life, listening for what his will is. So that we may be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. What's the thought box look like for you? As I've talked about it this morning. What's that look like for you? When you go in there and think about things, what are your primary inputs? What are the things that color and affect the things that you think in there? What things have happened in your past? Who are your present influences? And how are you doing in terms of discerning the spiritual influences and the impact they have on your lives? That's what we're working on through this series. I'm excited to go into it. I'm looking forward to talking with you about it. It's going to have a, I think it has a tremendous amount of application that we can take from it if you'll hang with me through it. Think this morning, though, which side do you listen to? Are you allowing the, the voice of darkness to influence you, to talk to you? Do you add value? Do you give value to that voice? Or are you seeking the voice of God? That's the question I'll leave you with this morning and encourage you to seek the voice of God. If you'd like to help us in your, in your walk to seek the voice of God or help in making a decision that your thought box just isn't giving you the answer to so you're, you're confused and you need to be in God's presence and to listen to him. We want to help you with that this morning. We'll have people up front who would love to pray with you. There's a room in the back that we've dedicated as a prayer room for those who would like a more private uh, time with someone. See someone about whatever it is that's going on in your thought box that, that keeps going around and around and around in there. Let us pray for you about it. Maybe it's not for you, but it's for someone else that you're concerned about. Let us pray with you about that. Prayer will make a difference. And in prayer, we hear God speaking. We'll talk about that later, how that's one of the ways that we hear God speaking to us. Allow him to speak to you as we pray with you, as someone prays with you this morning, if you have something we'd like to pray with you about. As, as usual, the content of that prayer will remain confidential unless you'd like, it to, like us to share it with the rest of the church. This morning, if you would like to take a step into the arms of a loving God, to know that he's got you, if you'd like to know what it's like to feel him calm your thought box, if you would like to have him calm you down and listen for his input, if you'd like for that to be your direction and you've not taken a step into his presence yet, that first step is through faith, believing in Jesus as the Son of God and then stepping into the waters of baptism, having your sins washed away and rising to walk in a new life. It's there where the Bible tells us that we get the gift of the Holy Spirit and it's the Holy Spirit that guides us to understand what God's saying to us. If you don't have that gift yet, you haven't even started on this journey like you should. 
If we can help you in any way, please let us know while we stand and sing this song to encourage you to do so. Let's stand. Amazing. Amazing.